Welcome to Beyond the Lab, a series by the Office of Career Development within the Biomedical Research, Education, and Training Department of the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. My name is Kate Stewart. I'm here today with Lori McGrew, who was a 2002 graduate of the Pharmacology Department. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, tell me about what you did when you were here at Vanderbilt. Sure. So I came to Vanderbilt because of the interdisciplinary graduate program in biomedical sciences, which was great for me because I wasn't entirely sure what field I wanted to pursue. Um, and I chose the pharmacology department largely because of my mentor in that department, Elaine Sanders Bush, who's a wonderful mentor. Um, and I tried to answer some questions about the biochemical signaling pathway of the serotonin 2 receptor that plays a large role in mood regulation. Um, and maybe I'll just say that, that, you know, I tried. Okay. I don't know. So <laughs> after graduate school, what was your path, even your first job right out? Sure, sure. So I was fortunate to um, have Elaine as my mentor who helped me think about where I fit best, and I wanted to get into teaching. So she gave me some opportunities to mentor some undergraduate students in the lab um, and to pick up a lecture or a paper discussion here or there. And after that, um, I got a term position at Belmont University, which is all the way across the street, a teaching institution, and um, during that year developed some teaching chops and managed to convince them that I was a good fit for the department and I've been there ever since. So I got a tenure track position um, and have worked my way from assistant to associate to full professor at this point, been there for 16 years, um, and it turned out to be a really great fit for me. Awesome. Okay, so what was that first year? At, at Belmont like I'm sure it was very different. A, a term position, so um, a full-time adjunct position, which is non-tenure track, um, viewed as a temporary appointment and a great way to get some teaching experience if you don't have any. So one of the things that was challenging for me in pharmacology was that most people were on the research track. Um, fewer people are pursuing teaching careers. And so trying to gain some real experience in thinking about classroom management and assessment strategies and those sorts of things to demonstrate that I had those abilities um, was more challenging. So I took this temporary um, teaching position that was a non-tenure track position um, in order to get some classroom time and it was kind of a sink or swim experience because I was teaching a full load um, but it turned out to be a great opportunity and um, let me get to know members of that department and think about how I fit. Okay so I'm sure your work is divided into teaching and service. Mm -hmm. What are even some research in, in some ways, Correct. How, how are they divided, um, you know, percentage-wise, but then how have they evolved probably sure. from the beginning? Sure. Great, great question. Um, so we typically think about three areas. Um, you're right, teaching is a big one, service, and then our sort of scholarship or professional development as that third area. And so early on, um, because I wasn't as versed in teaching, teaching was a bigger part of my time commitment. I spent more time thinking about how to develop teaching skills, about what style of teaching fit me, fit my students, um, and how I was going to assess their knowledge and those sorts of things. Um, but as I've kind of honed those abilities, I've shifted more um, in my service and um, professional development roles. And so in service, I'm on the Institutional Review Board, which is the board that oversees work with human subjects. Um, and that a, has a steep learning curve and um, not a lot of turnover, I guess, because of that steep learning curve. So that's been an area that I've been able to contribute a good bit in. Um, and then in thinking about shaping curriculum, as I get more familiar with where our students go, what they're coming to um, Belmont with, and what skills we want them to leave with, I've been able to play a larger role on um, program formation committees and assessment committees and that sort of thing. So in service, I've kind of grown um, more, and that plays a larger role and then in the professional development piece, um, that was an area where I came in strong because of my um, training in the pharmacology department. And I've tried to maintain knowledge in pharmacology and neuroscience. And so I go to those disciplinary conferences every year to try to keep that fresh. Um, but I've also branched into um, a lot more anatomy. There's a huge demand for anatomy teaching. Um, and we're blessed to have a cadaver lab on campus. 
Um, that was not something that I had the experience with as an undergrad or a graduate student, um, but the departments that oversee that space took me under their wing, and so that's an area where I've been able to grow some professional development. And I also um, mentor undergraduate students in research. Uh, there's a I guess a, a growing number of students who seek out those opportunities because they know that it helps them build skills that they won't get from the classroom or that are harder to get from the classroom. Um, and so I do more of that, especially during my summers um, when I'm not, I have a lot of teaching load. So Belmont, um, this job that you have, have you had for a while, you must have, you must be a good fit for it. You've been there, you know, 16 years, like you said. Yes. There must be some personal interest or skills that you possess that make you a good fit. So tell me about that. Yes, so um, I guess that would be one piece of advice that I'd have for students who are thinking about where they fit best. Um, one of the pieces of feedback that I remember getting early on after giving a presentation for the Pharmacology Forum, and I don't know if that's still a thing, is that still a thing? Yes. Oh yeah. So um, one of the postdocs said to me, um, your presentations are so animated, it's refreshing. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> so um, maybe you know that that means probably normal science research, not the best fit for me. I'm a little too animated for that. It was okay. He meant it with love, I think, but he was like, oh, Lori, what are you doing? Um, and the, so then I'm like, okay, uh, teaching is a great place where being animated and enthusiastic during those 8 a.m. classes, super important and a great skill. So I think that's why it's such a good fit for me. Um, I think uh, my, my B plan would have been, you know, to be the next Bill Nye or something. Maybe my own Discovery Channel slow, TED Talk, you know, something like that. That's another place where you can be animated and sciencey. So um, <laughs> that was just one of the things about my personality that um, I felt like, oh, okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, that is really helpful. And it shows up consistently on feedback that I get from students that um, my enthusiasm or my passion or whatever is one of the things that helps them um, stay invested, involved, learn, and that kind of thing. So um, that's one reason that I think this was a good fit for me. Um, and then I guess in thinking about being at a teaching institution, um, and that would be a, play, a piece of advice that I would provide to students is to think about how your um, disciplinary expertise fits with the other members of the department. So in our department, we have people whose skills are more whole organism or field-based or ecology, and then people whose skills lend um, themselves better to biochemical applications or genetics or something like that. And so my pharmacology and neuroscience training was um, an area that was underrepresented in our department and also meant that I was a good fit for helping to teach some of those upper level areas and that sort of thing. Um, in general, um, I guess I would say that, you know, if you're thinking about an introductory biology class, probably anyone who's loosely based in biology could pick up that textbook and teach that class and be fine. But it's in thinking about sort of the department offerings as a whole, like do you wanna have a pharmacology um, or neurobiology or neuroanatomy class? Could you do that based on your expertise and is that like a hole or a deficit in the department as it exists? So that was another reason that I was a good fit and that helped me sort of stay there and contribute. Right. So would you say that a postdoc would be necessary for a job that, like yours, yes. even today? Sure. Um, I would say it's more common, but still not necessary. So the tricky bit um, is to get that teaching experience. And sometimes that's a challenge if you're in a lab that's um, you know trying to keep their grant money coming in and they need to produce results to get that um, RO1 renewed and that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's hard to devote enough time to get that teaching expertise. Um, and that's where a teaching postdoc can sometimes be a good opportunity or an adjunct position um, like I took initially that can help you develop those teaching skills. But I will say that um, I sometimes have students who will just come and teach a lecture in their expertise because they're trying to get the idea of how it goes. And we're very open to that. Um, and it's great for us too because, um, you know, 
the visual system, not in my wheelhouse. I, I'm just gonna be honest. And I managed to struggle through it, but when I have somebody who loves it and is doing it all day, every day, and wants to come talk about Rhodopsin, great, come and give that lecture. Think about what it's like, how it'll be received by the students. Um, and I'll be happy to say, you know, hey, this person, here are some things that I think you could do better. Here are some things that you did really well. Here are some things to think about if you want to pursue this as a career. Um, and so there are some great opportunities to just come teach a lecture, even if you don't have the time to commit to a full course or a whole year. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so you've given some pretty great advice, but um, sort of a lasting um, statement or things you wish you would have known to graduate student, I mean, as a graduate student, or what you would want to tell graduate students now, even about the experience or just in professional development? Sure. What so you give? one of the things I was thinking about in um, transferable skills, so, you know, lab skills that you learn and content that you learn are all helpful and important. Communication, effective communication, great, and it's a good skill that we build. You know, writing a science paper is writing an argument, right? And you're listing your evidence and all that kind of stuff. And so I feel like those are skills that we learn that we know we learn. Um, but the one I was thinking about that I didn't really know I was learning and didn't know how much I would need is how you deal with failure. So um, not only in, you know, mentoring students who are trying to conduct some research and it, it doesn't go the way the labs that we set up go, right? So I get these text messages like, all the fish died and I don't even want to do science anymore. And you know, <laughs> it's like, okay, just push the plutonium rods back in. Let's figure out what's gonna, you know. Um, but in thinking about that, I was thinking about the number of times that in the lab, you really think this is the experiment, right? It's gonna work and you're gonna know the answer and it doesn't um, and it can be really disappointing. And what you do next is that critical piece. Like, am I thinking about um, how I'm gonna redesign the experiment? And so for students, it's important in that research aspect, but it's also important in lots of other ways. So sometimes that first test doesn't go very well, right? And they come to my office and they've worked really hard and they felt well prepared and why didn't this go better? And so in thinking about how to help them through that failure, or they applied for medical school and they didn't get in, and what's next, what am I gonna do? Does this mean I'm never gonna be a doctor? You know, And so those um, lessons of how you handle failure, and what you do in those next steps, I feel like were one of the soft skills that I learned that I didn't know I was learning and didn't know I was gonna need. <laughs> and so um, that would be one of the things that I think about often that um, was a really valuable ex part of the experience in addition to, you know, building relationships with people that I still have. Um, when I go to a lot of those disciplinary conferences, I see my, um, the other people who were in pharmacology or in my lab who are now doing completely different things, but we have the opportunity to catch up and think about how we can collaborate on things sometimes or just the information that we can share. Um, and so that's a really great, again, I guess outcome that I wasn't thinking about or didn't count on. Um, so I would say, you know, maintain those relationships, um, think about those life lessons. And don't forget that you're creative. Um, that was one of the things that I remember Lee Lindbergh telling us, and we didn't believe her, I don't think, at the time, but then reflecting back on it again, um, being able to design a good experiment requires a lot of creativity, and so people don't always appreciate that they have that too. Um, we think of ourselves as scientists as, you know, following black and white lines, but creative types too. Awesome. I agree. Well, thank you very much for coming back. Of course.